Hello, welcome to another session of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, and our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, which is a joint venture of PATH Presenter and uh, the Digital Pathology Association. Uh, our program, our uh, case today is a uh, unique case coming from the uh, realm of GI pathology. Um, a 75-year-old man has recently experienced difficulty swallowing and uh, has what appears to be an esophageal and maybe a gastric mass as well. So uh, that uh, leads us to think, of course, first of all, what are we likely to be looking for? Well, obviously in this age group, in this location, uh, and distal uh, esophageal mass is probably going to be an adenocarcinoma. Uh, which uh, often will be of the intestinal type, uh, but uh, various gastric types, diffuse types can be seen as well. And rarely we can identify neuroendocrine tumors. Squamous carcinoma is becoming less common in my practice, uh, although may still persist in other areas. And then of course there are stromal tumors like lyomyoma, more frequent in the esophagus than uh, other GI tract locations. Occasionally lyomyosarcoma, and uh, also less frequently GI stromal tumors along with other um, mesenchymal derived tumors. So uh, what are we likely to see in this case? Well, of course, we're thinking common things are common and here are our uh, biopsies. Uh, we see there's kind of a area of ulceration, some necrosis, of some blue areas, and then someone uh, put an ink dot on the slide down at that end, we should look there. Uh, but let's uh, go down here first on high magnification into this uh, very blue area. Uh, we don't see much in the way of architecture here. Obviously, we have uh, ne a necrosis and ulceration here along the surface. Um, and we can see that there's a little bit of vasculature streaming around in this lesion. Uh, here's some of that necrosis. We'll go to higher magnification here. Um, and let it come in here to see that this uh, diffuse population of cells uh, shows uh, areas of apoptosis. Uh, as we come into higher magnification, we'll see that there are uh, a small amount of cytoplasm. The chromatin is rather diffuse, um, granular appearing, um, and uh, there's really quite a degree of uh, mitotic activity here as well uh, in several areas. Uh, two or three per high power field in these areas. So this has kind of a uh, high grade neuroendocrine look to it. Um, here's a uh, thing. So we might think about possibly small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma uh, as a possibility or small cell undifferentiated carcinoma uh, in some terms. Uh, but let's see what else is uh, here as well as we look at this uh, case. Uh, so here's a little bit more of this, uh, evidently uh, ulcerating and presenting some uh, stringing uh, as a party type effect uh, around some of the vessels uh, with this abundant necrosis. And we'll move our way up to the uh, furthest most area of the slide here uh, in rather uh, challenging focus here. Apologize for that. Um, and this, of course, uh, reminds me to let you know that you can come back and uh, study these slides, uh, the digital slides on your own computer uh, after our presentation today. Let's go back out here to low magnification and let it uh, sort of start over. So let's focus here uh, on this area and let the slide load and depixelate. Um, we see, again, more granulation tissue um, but as this uh, piece comes into focus, we see that uh, additionally to this ulcerated area, we have some gland formation here. Now, there are a couple of possibilities. This could be just uh, uh, areas of uh, Barrett's esophagus with maybe dysplasia. But looking at the architecture here, um, it's pretty high grade tumor, uh, very uh, hyperchromatic, uh, complex architecture, uh, areas of uh, discohesion, uh, ulceration, 
and uh, some active uh, inflammation associated with that change. Uh, here's some other high-grade areas here, pleomorphism of the nuclei. And we don't see uh, evidence of uh, intestinal metaplasia uh, here uh, to go along with the idea of uh, Barrett's esophagus um, or just Barrett's esophagus. So uh, we're finding an area of glandular differentiation uh, in this uh, tumor. So uh, potentially a mixed uh, type of uh, neoplasm. Uh, we'll need to work this up and do some further stains. So uh, that's uh, indeed what we uh, do. Um, and here is a, a nice uh, representation of uh, the uh, neuroendocrine markers. And uh, we can see here at low magnification that uh, this first area, which we focused on, a lot of tumor, very strongly positive with synaptophysin. This uh, more remote area up here with the glandular differentiation shows a little bit of positivity, but not uh, diffuse and strong uh, in the same manner. <clears throat> it is sustaining some of the glandular differentiation here, which is uh, acceptable uh, in this situation. Uh, we're also interestingly getting some basal or keratinocyte uh, staining as well. Now, uh, we mentioned that there was a gastric mass, and just to sort of add a little richness to this uh, case as well, uh, here is that lesion which was snagged through the endoscope, and uh, as we can see here, has a uh, different appearance. Uh, it does not look neuroendocrine at all, um, and in fact, uh, this looks like a spindle cell uh, tumor um, with uh, a little bit of maybe epithelioid morphology here. Um, and this lesion stained positively with uh, DOG1 and uh, CD117, thus uh, nicely uh, fulfilling our criteria for a GI stromal tumor. Um, unusual that this is able to be snagged and removed easily by endoscopy, but this was a fairly small one. Um, and of course, they can follow that appropriately. So um, after establishing that diagnosis, the uh, patient went on to get a CT scan and a PET uh, scan. Um, and here we see the distal esophagus uh, just uh, uh, after it enters the abdominal cavity, uh, the esophagus here, and some extramural uh, tissue here. Uh, lighting up as well. On the uh, PET component of this scan, uh, the esophagus and this extramural tissue uh, lit up very strongly with a very high uh, 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 brightness and SUV uh, value. Uh, additionally, however, uh, this patient had uh, several lymph nodes uh, positive uh, in the suprachorinal area here we see the trachea, and we're uh, above the bifurcation of the trachea. Um, so this is very uh, worrisome for possible metastatic disease or uh, question regional, local regional nodal disease. So um, just to sort of put uh, mixed neuroendocrine and non-neuroendocrine neoplasms into context, this was previously called uh, manic mixed adeno-neuroendocrine carcinoma. Now it's called mixed neuroendocrine, non-neuroendocrine uh, carcinomas, or minin, or neuroendocrine tumors. Um, it does not include the pure large cell or small cell neuro neuroendocrine tumors. And usually in these tumors, both the neuroendocrine and non-neuroendocrine components are high grade, uh, relatively poor, poorly differentiated. Uh, as in our case, uh, sometimes the neuroendocrine markers can be expressed in both components. Um, and uh, no longer is it required that there be a specified percentage of the, each component. Um, and of course, uh, as uh, distinct from other areas of the GI tract, neuroendocrine tumors and neuroendocrine carcinomas of the esophagus are staged similarly to uh, other tumors of the esophagus. There's not a separate uh, staging system as there is in the stomach uh, GI and lower GI tract. These patients uh, with high-grade tumors tend to have some challenges and uh, survival is not uh, optimal, but they're usually treated with platinum-based uh, chemotherapies. 
just as a review, I think there are a couple of staging issues and potential pitfalls that should be remembered in the esophagus. Uh, some apply to our case and others do not. Uh, the first one, and perhaps the most commonly encountered one, is uh, whether it's the tumor should be staged as T1A versus T1B. Of course, this is dependent upon penetration beyond the muscularis mucosa. But since uh, oftentimes the muscularis mucosa in the esophagus, uh, particularly in Barrett's, uh, can be reduplicated, uh, in other words, split, uh, it's difficult sometimes to be sure that uh, that level of invasion is truly uh, into submucosa through the uh, muscularis mucosa. Uh, the best markers we have for that are the presence of uh, large caliber vessels and more especially uh, submucosal glands uh, of the esophagus. Um, as in our case, defining regional versus distant lymph node metastasis uh, can be a difficult uh, uh, challenge based on uh, whether the tumor is occurring in the uh, distal esophagus or whether it's in the mid portion of the esophagus. And then finally, a lot of uh, tumors in the esophagus are treated with uh, neoadjuvant chemoradiation. Um, and if they produce any amount of mucin, may leave behind uh, these acellular mucin pools, uh, which should not be uh, staged as being tumor. Uh, now, of course, you want to do reasonable amount of sectioning to be sure that you're not missing occasional rare viable residual tumor cells, and therefore it should be staged as being tumor. But if you just have acellular mucin, uh, that is not staged as uh, the depth of invasion by that means. So that's just an important little caveat to be aware of. So uh, here's a kind of a nice diagram from the CAP checklist and also from the staging manual, uh, illustrating the various uh, stations of uh, mediastinal and uh, upper uh, abdominal lymph nodes that may be sampled or harvested uh, in the course of a, a, a distal or partial esophagectomy. Um, some of these are done routinely, uh, you know, 4L, 7L, station 9, 8, uh, and so forth. Um, these probably are the most frequently harvested, 7, 8, and 9. Uh, but other lymph node groups can occasionally also be uh, harvested if we're dealing with a more mid or upper esophageal level, uh, two, six, five. Uh, and with more distal lesions, occasionally you get down into 16 and 17. I think I have yet to see them label anything as uh, 18, 19, or 20, but they often may use the uh, gastrohepatic uh, lymph node designation for, for these nodes down here. Now, the question as to whether something is truly regional uh, depends a bit on where the tumor originates. So tumors at the GE junction, as with our case, um, I think uh, things below the car carina, below eight, level seven, uh, and uh, uh, above uh, level 20 here would qualify as regional lymph nodes. Uh, things that go beyond pylor peripyloric or uh, 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 gastrohepatic uh, ligament, uh, lymph nodes, uh, hilar lymph nodes, those would be uh, extra uh, regional, as would uh, lymph nodes up here in the two uh, and four region, six region above the uh, carina. Uh, so in our case, uh, the uh, positive uh, lymph node in, on the PET scan above the uh, carina would be uh, uh, considered a distant metastasis rather than a local uh, regional metastasis. So our final sign out on this case is a high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma with areas of adenocarcinoma consistent with a mixed neuroendocrine, non-neuroendocrine carcinoma or minin. Appreciate you joining us for this program today and hope that this uh, brief review of a somewhat uh, uncommon tumor in the distal esophagus has been helpful. Uh, and if you like our, uh, our program, we do hope you'll subscribe so that you'll catch new releases. Uh, it does help the uh, channel get some attention. And especially uh, if you like or share this uh, content, that also uh, helps us to spread this, uh, the availability of this to a little further uh, and wider audience of uh, potentially interested uh, trainees and practitioners in pathology. Uh, our goal is to help uh, to raise the level and quality of uh, practice uh, throughout the world 
and uh, your part in sharing or uh, subscribing can help to do that as well. So until next time, uh, thanks so much for joining me and uh, we'll hope to see you on a program soon.